Hello and welcome to the Royal Academy of Engineering STEM webinar series. I'm Rhys Morgan, I am your host for today. I'm the Education Director at the Academy. Last week we heard from Dr Ruth Graham on the global state of the art for engineering education in universities. You can find that and all our other webinars on the Academy's website under the Education section. And just to remind you that today's webinar will also be recorded. So today we're going back to primary school. So cross your legs, sit quietly on the mat, put your fingers on your lips and no fidgeting. We heard from at the very start of our webinar series from uh, Professor Bill Lucas, uh, who argued the need to uh, develop in young people a series of what we might call meta skills or engineering habits of mind. These would be useful not to just to uh, proto engineers, would be engineers, but also to all young people. But it's all very well for Bill to proselytize and pontificate on these new fangled ideas. But actually what happens at the chalk face is the challenge. How do we develop these pedagogies, teaching and learning approaches that nurture and cultivate these characteristics or attributes in young children within the education system? So today we have Dr. Lynn Bianchi from the University of Manchester, who with her team has been working with primary schools around Greater Manchester to develop these pedagogies. Lynn uh, is a former primary school teacher herself uh, in Manchester, so should know a thing or two about teaching small children. Since then, she has developed her expertise in teacher professional development and curriculum innovation and research. In 2014, she established the uh, Science and Engineering Education Research and Innovation Hub at the University of Manchester. Her areas of focus uh, in, uh, look at improving uh, primary science and engineering education, teacher professional development, and uh, new pedagogies working across primary, secondary, and higher education. She is the creator and director of the National Great Science Share for Schools campaign, which involves over 60,000 uh, children a year. And a quick plug uh, for that, it, uh, the main day this year is next Tuesday, and they already have over 50,000 uh, people registered. So please find out more from the Great Science Share uh, website, and you can register for that yourselves. So just to be clear, uh, in my post this week, I may have confused some people. This is not to do with the primary engineer STEM activity uh, provider interventions in schools. This is rather an academic research project uh, supported by the Academy to look at tinkering or purposeful play as a pedagogy for nurturing engineering habits of mind. Once again, a reminder that we'll be having a question and answer session at the end of the talk, so please do get your questions ready. Lynn will be joined by colleagues Julie Wisco from Road Heath Primary School and her co-researcher Dr Jonathan Chippendall. So uh, the last thing to mention is that we have opened up the chat function uh, this week, so please do feel free to chat and uh, post comments during the presentation. Right, what is the point in engineering when you're eight years old? To answer that question and many more, I'm now going to hand over to Lynn Bianchi. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Reese, for that introduction. I hope everything's working okay here. Um, it's nothing worse than waiting for you to be introduced. It's like waiting for a bus, but we've got started now, so I'll, I'll make a start. I'm going to spend a little bit of time today, and thank you for joining, and thanks for the Academy for the opportunity to do this, to talk about the key question that we've been exploring um, for around five years now. And it's a quite a simple question, but it's a very pertinent one. So the question that we've been working on um, has been so if you could just jump to the next slide um has always been how can engineering have relevance and resonance within the primary school curriculum we want to make sure that it's got relevance that it's actually a, a part of the curriculum that isn't an add-on that is inclusive and it's there for every child to have this opportunity 
and it's got resonance and thus it brings our curriculum alive. Um, there's no point adding things on for the sake of it. It's got to be something that uh, motivates and enthuses both teachers and children and the school community. And that's where we really wanted to see where we could build that resonance and, and was, was it there. And, and that's really driven our studies over the past five years. And when we started this, um, we were faced with a brand new primary science curriculum, a curriculum which was much more focused on working scientifically as opposed to knowledge acquisition, or we were using working scientifically to develop knowledge. And we also had a brand new computing curriculum also that came into the primary um, teacher's hands. And this all culminated at the same time as us starting up our department here at the University of Manchester, where we have um, really explored both um, how pr uh, primary engineer, uh, uh, engineering in primary schools can take place and also primary science can also be improved. So I'll just move on to the next slide. As I talk also, um, I've got this two pictures on here. People might be more familiar with the one on the bottom right, which was the very original engineering habits of mind um, diagram that was published uh, by Bill Lucas and his colleagues at the Centre for Real World Learning, somebody who we are very blessed to have uh, interconnection with all of, most, most of the time in terms of this area of work. And their newest publication of that um, model of engineering habits of mind, which you can see there in the in the red, yellow, and um, orange. I won't talk much about that because I know Bill spent more time around that. But this is very much created um, a framework, a framework through which we could start to talk with teachers and head teachers about how we could look towards building this relevance and resonance. And having the engineering habits of mind gave us that grounding, that firm grounding. So I'll, there are there's got lots written about this and others say um, that's more to flick back to Bill's uh, early webinar if you want to hear more about that. The next slide takes us on a journey and that this is the journey that I'll talk a little bit more to this morning. So we looked initially uh, in the first year really at, at engineering landscapes. We wanted to really understand the engineering process, a contemporary form of engineering and we had this in bucket loads in the Faculty of Science and Engineering within the university, which houses nine different engineering schools. And so there was lots of engineers that we could talk with. And when I say we, we're talking as a team, but our team extends to practicing teachers drawn mainly from Greater Manchester for these initial projects, where we work very much in tandem with them. Um, we're, a, we're very much an applied research group. So we were looking to understand engineering as a process and whether that process was already existing within primary education or where there were aspects of it. We then moved on to looking at um, how we could teach for engineering. So, OK, if we managed to understand it, what would teaching uh, for engineering look like? What would it look like? What would it feel like? What would it sound like? And how would our primary classrooms need to change or be adapted in order to embrace that? Our past couple of years have much more look at, looked towards the systemic and, um, embedding of engineering within primary schools because without that, however much we can understand it or have the pedagogy or the approaches for it as a system-wide thing, we weren't really going to be able to make this um, really embedded. So working with school leadership, we look towards the principles for engineering in primary schools and now really biting much um, the hardest bullet I think that we've, we're going to have to face which is if we've got all of this really having relevance and resonance then how do we really um, look at the hard questions around what does progression look like and is there an assessment for engineering education in primary schools that we might which we'll need to look at um, and those questions are still playing out and I'll give you an insight into that area of work as well within this within this half hour so the next slide enables us to see the method by which I won't dwell on this because it's been published in previous documents, but um, it basically talks of the approach um, and the style of um, development that we've been undertaking very much with teachers, uh, engaging them in a social um, construction of knowledge around this area. Um, we very rarely do things to them and why I'm really pleased that we've both got Julie Wisco um, 
here on this webinar who is a teacher who's very much gone up this whole trajectory. She's participated, collaborated, and she's now forging ahead with the co-creation of new approaches and connecting. So it's the way and the method that we use, but it's very much fundamental to how this project has been developed. So these stages will now lead us through the next few slides. When we first started participating in this landscape, so if we could have the next slide, is that all right? <laughs> Thanks. Um, we, you know, as I say, 2014, we needed to look at how we could talk about engineering um, in primary school settings. And as many of you will know, I'm sure I'm not I'm needing to uh, tell you this, but it's not a feature, it's not a subject area within um, the science uh, within uh, primary at the moment science itself has um, been downplayed quite a quite a lot recently since the removal of the SATs tests with literacy and numeracy you know of course we need to read and write and I have no challenge with that but it's been at the compensa you know it's been at the um, reduction of the profile of primary science so engineering and design technology um, are very little pro they have very little profile in primary so we took an approach to speaking with teachers about this and trying to enthuse them to get, come on board. And it was at a time also, um, as the next slide will um, demonstrate, it really, um, there was a lot coming out uh, in the literature around Tinker Labs, Tinker Lab Gardens, the maker movement was much more prolific in terms of their writing and their publications. And tinkering started to float as an idea, as a, as a concept. And it seemed that when we spoke, with senior leaders and teachers about whether they'd like to embrace tinkering more within their classrooms, light started to come on in their eyes. They, they seem to be very engaged with that concept. Um, for us, it was a synonym really for engineering, um, but we went down that road and we really explored it in much more depth and looked into the documentation around tinkering, which is, is fascinating. And I encourage you to, to have a read around it. The quote, the um, working definition that you can see on the screen is one that the teachers forged. Uh, you might agree, you might not agree with what it says, but it was the sense that was coming through of needing primary school um, settings, especially at key stage two, our junior years, to get back to making, to get back with a playful uh, approach to learning, where fiddling and toying about and messing and pottering you see they're dabbling and fooling about with things with a diverse range of things was what teachers were saying they wanted back in their classrooms and that was what what was missing it was important that that wasn't just play for play's sake it, and 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 the notion of play often gets aligned with tinkering but for us it was the purposeful and productive pursuit uh, uh, within that play to make mend or improve that really um, gave the resonance of, of tinkering and why tinkering became um, adopted very much by teachers within schools, even to the point of them coining their own phrases like tinkology, which they call the science, the science of tinkering. Um, if you want to read more around this, there's some really lovely work by Resnick and Rosenbaum, um, which has the dialogue around um, tinkering and the use of tinkering in the, in the in this area of work um, and why it does help us to address um, some of the ideas that we're having but again with with the time that we've got i just encourage you um, to link with that or um, we can chat afterwards more around what they say where that takes us then or where that took teachers was to grab hold of this notion of tinkering and take it into the classroom and this is where teachers creativity comes to the fore as you can see in the next slide we oh just pop back one please so there should be a photograph is there um okay we seem to be missing a few slides i'm not sure why okay just hold on that one then um okay so i'll talk to talk to this Okay, so what, what should be on screen at, at the moment is um, there's a photograph of school governors coming into the classroom, ex-engineers, um, grandmas in fact who had been engineers, and they started to come into children's classrooms, talk about the process of engineering, talk about tinkering, talk about their experiences, and to bring that engineering landscape 
very much into the dialogue of primary classrooms. And I'd encourage that to continue happening, and we have continued to see that happening, where they brought not just a making process into the classroom, but they brought an unmaking process into it too, where things were being taken apart and looked into and, and deconstructed rather than constructed. Something that was new, you know, it was new and it was novel um, within the classrooms which we were working within. Colin seemed to um, also come quite opportunistically for us at this point as well, when in 2015 um, and 16, the European City of Science came to Manchester and Danielle George launched her robot orchestra. Many of our schools took their tinkering and applied it to this challenge and we saw how children really embrace um, competition. Um, it's not something that I'm a massive advocate for at all, but challenge seemed to up their game. Their, their creativity was sparked as they created brand new, um, brand new um, instruments that then played within the robot orchestra. So the, the notion of having audience as well, and, and real audience where, where their innovations would be showcased and, and needed to stand the test of time, um, but also seemed to be an aspect of this area of tinkering that really made their, their, um, their play purposeful and productive. There was an audience, there was an output, there was a challenge and they were there to meet it. That was a very exciting year. We were, you might say, laying the railway track as we went on that one and, and the Academy was um, happy enough to have that conversation and dialogue with us with teachers. I think we'll, we could now well jump to the next slide if, uh, if we'll there, that's okay. So um, at this point, um, the things that you can see on screen are just features of a, an infographic that really summarised where the learning had got to just in that early year in, year in year one. We were using tinkering. We found that tinkering definitely had more traction um, and actually had a, um, a visibility within, especially the early years, and something that we wanted to, to embrace and take forward but we needed to formalize that so we published at this point uh, both John and myself co-authoring a piece which talked around tinkering but not you know it's tinkering for learning and tinkering with learning and then this notion of per process with purpose we needed to really communicate to the engineering community that that we weren't playing this was a disciplined approach and a disciplined approach that applied into primary school settings just using slightly different language, which basically created this bridge, this enthusiasm for, um, for the engineering habits of mind and the process. Okay, so I'll come back to the original question on what I hope to be the next slide. Um, right, so that's the slide. So just keep going, Sophie. We seem to have some slides out of sync. Keep going. Just one more, please, and one more again. There we are. Okay, well, looks like we're back to it. Okay, so what does this really mean for an eight-year-old? That was my question at the start, and I choose eight quite deliberately, and I'll explain that in a short while. But what we saw for an eight-year-old, so you're talking of a child in year three um, in, um, in, our, in our English curriculum, we saw what we can say is a serendipity-infused process of learning. It was a style of learning that was different in that, that we were allowing children to explore, to take their curiosity in ways that they felt that they wished to take it, to bring their personalities to the learning process and to learning challenges in a purposeful way. Teachers spoke at this time about fantastic failures. It was a term that was coming out of um, Carol Dweck's growth mindset work and it was being applied in this context because in many of the scenarios that were playing out in these classrooms, we weren't looking for, for finished, um, beautifully produced products. We were looking for the process of engineering to have taken place, for children to have prototyped uh, an idea and maybe then you know, used it and, and to the point of failure. And actually the, the point of failure was the point of innovation to their next uh, iteration of that make. So the failures became really, really important, but also developing their resilience through failure um, became very tangible. Tinkering became a language for engineering within the classroom, and we saw many more applied learning contexts. So we didn't see 
um, you know, uh, well, we saw, let's not say what we didn't see, let's see what we did see. We saw teachers um, approaching the learning by taking ideas from their history topics or from their science topics and applying those contexts to a challenge. So the, the um, engineering started to have resonance, not just within um, separate parts of the curriculum, but across it. For children themselves, we saw them having much more positive engagement. Um, there was a lot of talk and uh, parity of esteem between teachers and children sharing in talk around the process of making. We saw teachers talk to us about children who were potentially less able or seemingly less able in terms of our more traditional curriculum or less engaged now being more included and feeling that they had a voice and um, application of their skill set and strengths within this environment. And we saw children having much more agency to make decisions around what they could make, how they could make it in a much more creative and curious way. So the term hands on and minds on um, was very, very clear in those early sets of times. This became then a chance for us, you can see um, if you just click it will act itself as for us to take a more systematic approach. Um, we wanted in order to be able to look across the curriculum both maybe we worked with secondary at this stage to look at how those early dabblings that we'd had um, with embedding engineering within the primary curriculum could become more systematic. What you would, um, where we were at now was developing a range of case studies which demonstrated how the engineering Uh, one thing I'm not quite seeing the screen moving on. We seem to be having a few problems with your uh, connection here. Lynn, might I suggest that you just turn your video off for the time being and we'll see if we can uh, uh, just hear your voice as you go through the presentation. Lynn, can you hear me? Okay, while Lynn is struggling to uh, connect, I might ask uh, Jonathan Chippendall. Oh, Lynn, are you back? Okay, so uh, uh, we've got a message. Lynn can hear us, but sh we're, we're struggling to hear her. M uh, might I ask um, uh, Jonathan, her uh, collaborator on this project, to come in? And uh, see, while we're trying to get Lynn back, um, uh, her connection back, maybe Jonathan can uh, uh, continue uh, with the presentation. I don't know how uh, um, you're able to do that. Uh, John, just uh, in, uh, talk about the principles. Yeah, can you hear me okay, Rhys? Yes, perfect. Right, okay, cool. I'm gonna leave my video off as well, just to make sure that we just focus on, um, on a good connection yes so um, the work we did with teachers um, was around developing the principles of um, primary engineering in their schools um, and can I just see uh, I'm not uh, completely familiar with Lynn's slide deck here but I don't know if we skip forward whether we've got a slide with the different principles on um, just go on one more for us uh, yes there we go so I can talk around these um, so we worked with um, a group of teachers and um, to kind of uh, and we did some we did some visits out to the different schools these are teachers which we'd already sort of taken um, on our 
journey a little bit and worked with them and they were doing engineering in schools and um, we wanted to go out to their schools and then kind of uh, distill down what what was happening what the good practice was uh, into these kind of principles um, uh, so we could kind of sh share these more widely with other schools um, so th this is what we ended up with. Um, we've got seven principles and Lynn has kind of talked a little bit about some of these already in an indirect way because they are things such as pupils who are engaged in purposeful practice, pro practical, uh, problem solving um, and they take ownership of the design and make process and things like embracing and learning from failure as well. So that was something really important. Uh, we've seen a lot in... Uh, in many of the schools, the style of teaching was very um, hands off, letting pupils lead the learning. One interesting point on that, though, is it didn't necessarily mean that it didn't require a lot of planning, almost the opposite. There was a lot of um, planning involved ahead of the lesson to ensure that all of the conditions were right so that pupils could then uh, have access to everything they needed and lead the uh, learning themselves and you know, tackle these engineering challenges. Um, we really valued curiosity and creativity um, and that that was responded to by the teachers as well. So what we're sort of talking about there is that pupils could were free to sort of pursue their own solutions to problems. So it wasn't that p teachers already had a kind of ideal solution in their mind for um, the you know the solutions to challenges they're being presented they could actually use their own creativity own curiosity um, to come up with their own unique uh, solutions to problems so we thought that was really important um, also the link with mastery to other curriculum areas obviously there's lots of application of maths and science within engineering so it provided an ideal opportunity for pupils to be doing an engineering challenge and then suddenly say well hang on i need to I need some knowledge of materials or knowledge of forces here. Oh, I now realize why we've been learning about the properties of materials or um, forces in science. I can apply that or I can look, uh, I need to create a structure and I uh, can apply my learning from maths about geometry. So it was ideal um, opportunity to demonstrate mastery from other subject areas. Um, and I'm just going to go through the last couple and then I'll hand back to Lynn. Um, also, uh, we wanted pupils to be drawing on a range of thinking skills and personal capabilities. And there's an interesting crossover here. Lynn mentioned earlier about computing coming in around the time we started on this. And a part, big part of computing is computational thinking, the problem solving skills um, of uh, general problem solving skills um, that we, uh, and the kind of toolkit of thinking skills we can use. Um, to solve problems, things like breaking problems down, decomposition, focusing on what's important, abstraction. And likewise, we wanted people to be using sort of similar skills when they were problem solving in engineering as well. And really importantly, um, number seven uh, was about it being a whole school approach. And I think we've got a really nice quote on the uh, slide just before this. If we can just go back one slide, there we go. This was one of the head teachers of uh, schools that's been really heavily involved in the project throughout a number of years, um, Nicola, um, talking about uh, trusting in staff that they will drive towards higher standards and that she it was all about play play and play some more um, they really embraced the pedagogies around what we're talking about here within their school and and that and other things feel that they they feel that it's had a sort of transformational um impact into the ethos, <laughs> ethos of their learning in their school so with that i think lynn is back so if you're there lynn i'll hand back over to you if that's okay um i'm back Yes, you are back. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. Apologies. I've no idea what went on. Um, if we can just slip, uh, slip on to the, that slide there. Thanks, Sophie. Um, I'm going to try and just move on a little bit now um, just to again, just to go back to, you know, so what's that got to do with an eight year old? At this stage, what we recognised through the embedding of those principles within schools is a whole school approach to engineering. Making and prototyping were seen from EYFS now up to key stage two. The notion of split screen lessons, which Bill mentioned in his webinar one, 
um, came through where we were talking both of engineering habits of mind and the curriculum. There were school assemblies, there was regular visits and visitors, uh, displays, uh, recognition and reward for children for their engineering habits of mind. But again, we felt that we need, still needed to question how systematic the approach was being taken and whether we could firm that up even more um, in terms of the regular systems for primary education, which involved, of course, not just teaching and learning, but also assessment. So our new area of work is into progressing to be an engineer, which was um, on the next slide. And if, we've, um, if you just nick, uh, nick on one there again, um, we've taken what you might class as a, a brave approach to take a, a chunk out of um, what is a very difficult area to try and look towards how we measure impact with children that are engaged in this. How do we know that they're learning? What does it look like for a learner at age four as opposed to aged eight as opposed to age 11? And how can we drive that alongside and within the curriculum that we've got um, both science, maths, computer science and DT? The next slide you'll see is how we've taken our curriculum, our existing national curriculum for England, and we have also looked at the engineering habits of mind and also the engineering design process. And although this will be far too small to read, it will be published in the autumn. Um, it is an attempt to place a learning progression uh, for key stage one and key stage two in order that we can see the stages of development that take place for children when engaged in an engineering education in primary school settings. It's a, um, we did a very large scoping of the literature globally. There isn't one of these that currently stands where it's been used for accreditation purposes. There's much more in the US and obviously we've got more leanings now within our Scottish and Welsh curricula. But the next slide will show you the areas of work where we're looking now to exemplify teachers' activity with children in the classroom so that they can give much stronger formative feedback when children are engaged in, in engineering. And also the planning process can be much more specific and targeted and age related. As I say, this will be coming through um, uh, in a report that uh, we're all co-authoring at the moment. Um, uh, with the Academy, uh, which would, should be with you by the autumn. So in coming back to the question in terms of what's the point of engin in engineering when you're eight years old? Well, for us, it's a no-brainer. It gives meaningful opportunities where children have agency, autonomy, curiosity and applied learning. Four things which are, were being wheeled out of our curriculum in a much more traditional and standardised approach to the acquisition of knowledge. We've taken a systems thinking and applied approach to that, this ourselves in trying to make sure that it aligns and embeds within the curriculum for all children and moving away from the STEM club type approach. Um, the next slide is my challenge really, which I'll leave us with and possibly have some opportunity to talk with through your questions as well. Um, just one slide on please. Um, Really, we talk about STEM, but in a primary school context, we often just focus on the science and the maths. For me, it's like a sandwich, but we'll only put in the two bits of bread at each end, and the flavour and the filling is lost if we don't embrace design technology and engineering within that sandwich. We've got to be able to give our curriculum substance and to apply science and apply maths and tinkering or engineering gives us that relevance and that resonance. We have got a window of opportunity with our new Ofsted framework with the new intent um, implementation and impact where we are allowed as teachers and, and school governors and leaders to design curricula which are fit for our children. And if we really believe in this, it's not a matter of waiting for the DfE to put engineering in, in the primary as a subject, but it's to find our ways and our levers to embed it and so I'll draw this to a close to say if you want to find out any more about the way that we're continuing to work in this area and connect with schools, um, the Greater Manchester Engineering Challenge, which is the next slide on, is definitely the next two slides on, is definitely showing how that can have uh, resonance and relevance. Applied maths, applied science, applied DT in great engineering contexts. And the next two slides offer you an insight into some of the publications that you can access that also will relate to this work. 
I apologise for the tech issues, Rhys. Um, I can't do much about it other than wait for them to come back. But that concludes um, the input for now. Thank you, Lynn. You can blame the engineers. Um, <laughs> Uh, right, so uh, um, we've got lots of questions and I'm, I'm keen to uh, get on because we haven't got a huge amount of time, but I'd like to invite uh, Julie and John to uh, join uh, the uh, Q&A uh, questions. And I, I'd actually quite like to turn to Julie first and, and uh, just a, something I uh, wanted to ask um, as you presented the, the early part of your presentation, Lynn. Um, working with the school leadership, you mentioned, I, and I was trying to think, what's the sell here? Um, you know, the schools have got pressures from Ofsted, they've got accountability measures, focuses very much on literacy and numeracy. So um, why were they engaged in the first place with the concept of tinkering? And I'd quite like to just hear your views, Julie. Um, I think it's really difficult, Rhys. I think you need uh, to have a really brave head because it's something that's very different. Um, in terms of our school, I think it was uh, really useful. We started off with the tinkering in a small way. So we started off with um, just working in years three and four and observing the behavior of the children. And it was the resilience that we saw the uh, children engaged in their learning, children who normally were not on task or on task for an hour. Um, they were taking apart equipment, they were putting it together and it was all these behaviours and the things that were, children were saying to their peers in other classes uh, that um, started to disseminate this really sort of, this creative, exciting atmosphere across school which was then noticed by the teachers uh, and really the head had no alternative but to take note and uh, try and try it out in the other classes and, but and you do need brave head yes and i imagine you need brave teachers as well because they are kind of giving up control are they not i mean you know you're allowing children to really explore in a way that you know doesn't allow you the kind of control you'd normally have in a more didactic type of teaching environment yeah, it was, a, it was a very different way of teaching. It was really sort of uh, standing back and, and only intervening where you could offer some useful support and not giving the answers, but making, making suggestions. Um, but it, it, it just worked really well. Um, and it created a culture, certainly in our school, of resilience, of not being afraid of failure. It doesn't matter. It's part of learning. Um, and we're... we're I have to say we're four years down the road now, but we now have, have embraced the culture of engineering habits of mind in school and uh, it's reaping huge rewards. That's really interesting. It's, it's, it's fascinating to hear, you know, what, what happened actually in the school. Um, just a few um, questions. I'm going to go to the, um, uh, the Q&A box because we've had quite a lot of questions already and I'm quite keen to, to get people to hear uh, their questions. Um, so very simply, first off, um, uh, either Lynn or yourself, uh, Julie or Jonathan, um, the, the STEM ambassadors. Now you mentioned earlier, um, you know, uh, and you showed the photo of the, the grandparent uh, coming in to, to help uh, fix uh, the computers and things like that. Um, did you use STEM ambassadors or did you purposefully decide, no, actually we want local can, more? Can I answer that, Rhys? Yes, yeah, please do. Please do. Um, I, think, I think STEM ambassadors are critical because it's really important for children to see real engineers. But I think what you don't realise is actually amongst the parents in the school, a huge number actually work in engineering. So uh, we were lucky at that, uh, very lucky at Road Heath because we, we have forged really strong links with Siemens, but that actually is because uh, a parent of a child actually worked for Siemens. So I right. think looking in your school and asking which parents uh, are engineers and would be happy to come in is, is, is a really good starting point. Yeah, yes. I think yeah. I think you're right. I mean, we've had. Um, I think it's been a bit of an eclectic mix. Definitely STEM ambassadors. There's widening participation fellows at universities. We've been in contact with obviously the institutions. Um, for instance, your own fellows, Reese and ICE, um, Siemens, BASF. I think you know we're drawing on as many engineers and those in the business of engineering, not just the ones that who are you know. Um, 
at the forefront maybe of, of making things, but who are the businesses that also support the engineering process, even intellectual property lawyers and things like that, trying to sort of demonstrate the world of engineering and how it works. Um, Rashad Hussain asks uh, whether you considered similar initiatives outside the school setting. And I'm just thinking about uh, the work of Louise Archer in terms of science capital. It's what you do, you know, in formal learning environments as well. Did, th did this project extend outwards to other uh, learning environments? Um, well, we focused, uh, Sari's work is very much committed to um, mainstream education and, and piloting and trialling things for as many children as possible within mainstream. So not so much, in all honesty, in terms of the research arm, but some of the dissemination work has gone into museums at Manchester Science and Industry Museum, for instance, where we've had more family engagement. And the challenges that you can see through GMEC do extend to some level of family engagement. But, you know, to be honest, the, the, the main steer on this has been through mainstream primary ed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, Carl, Rev oh sorry, Jonathan, did you want to say something? Yeah, no, sorry, I was just going to, to come in there and because um, I've just been typing out a few answers to the questions that I've seen that come to a couple of people have been asking about resources and stuff. So where, uh, I've just been sending a few people onto that. But one of the themes that I just noticed in a couple of the answers would uh, something really interests me. I wondered if I could share. I'm picking my own questions, I think here recently a little bit actually. <laughs> but there was. Go for it. Is that okay? Because a few people have been talking about um, higher attainers and pupils in school that are used to getting things right, that are used to almost sort of following algorithms for um, how to do sums and rattle through those. How do they find this idea of tinkering where it is not as prescribed the route through to success? In fact, success, you know, it's not defined as much. And that's really interesting. We have noticed that um, pupils can initially struggle with that and actually in um, Bill you mentioned Bill's done one of these and he writes about you know uh, pupils that are used to really succeeding in this school structure when you go into the big wide world and problems aren't as defined how do they get on and one thing we know interesting observation that we notice is it's the younger pupils that actually do better at this because our schooling system almost over the time they're in school more more towards with the standardized testing this is what you're going to learn this is how you're going to do it and this is how you're going to repeat it in the test so yes they do initially struggle and you have to work with them we've done some work in the past where we've paired up youngsters like year ones and year sixes and the year sixes were kind of the experts in terms of then you know subject knowledge but the year ones were actually the experts in terms of just having a go at things being curious giving it a try and that worked really really well so i just wanted to share that because it's a theme that's come through in a mm -hmm. few of the questions that have come, mm -hmm. come in and, and just building on that because uh, i think the um uh, question from Rizal again around the um the proficiency or the competency of the teachers in in terms of their technical abilities was that a, a factor in how successful these projects were yeah I, I think you know part of what we've done is is creating a culture where i like to think everyone is feels really comfortable in just in the same way we're trying to instill this in the work we're doing the pupils the teachers say um you know i don't know how to do that yet and i can say that and i can think about how i'm going to find out what i need to do um to develop my knowledge around that um and sometimes it is about learning with uh, along with the pupils a little bit mm -hmm. julie um, and your your view on that i i think i think that's true i think teachers do initially need a lot of support um and that's what we've tried to do at the university as well bringing teachers in and upskilling them uh, in my school what i try and do is uh, have uh, a whole school engineering day once a term to keep the momentum going and i would initially i provided all the support for that so i would provide the 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 ideas the lesson plans bring the engineers in but gradually over the years that we've been doing it teachers have taken more initiative and uh, been able to uh, construct the lessons themselves um, but i do think yes initially there's a reluctance because teachers like to be able to do things don't they they don't like to fail um but john's right actually it's quite exciting learning alongside your children um and i can do a lot more things now than than i could do four years ago yeah yeah um uh, another really uh, 
important point here uh, uh, raised by Tina Roos um, is around uh, the, the gender uh, uh, divide here. So um, girls self-identity starts to form around uh, age five or six and their self-assessment about their intellectual ability is found to change between ages five and six. They start thinking science is for boys and they start to kind of rule themselves out. And of course, Louise Archer again has drawn on this kind of work. Um, Lynn, did you find anything uh, confirming this in, in this uh, research? Okay, so this this extends to the sort of the applied area, um, which we were when we we're doing the Greater Manchester Engineering Challenge more so. So um, you're you're quite right in your um your your reading around this. Now at primary we didn't see a massive gender difference in terms of engagement, um, in terms of you know, um, interest, but um what we have made more of is the social implications of engineering. So um, I think we naturally, and I'll, I won't blame John, but he's a, he loves his planes. And so we started off um, in the, in, you know, with some of the contexts which were much more around mechanical and engine and electrical, um, which would be the, sort of maybe the more traditional, you know, let's make a robot type of approach. Lately, we have played much more to demonstrating to children how um, their engineering can improve people's lives. And this does seem to have engaged the girls uh, much more passionately about the work that they're doing when they're creating something to support individuals to live better, to, to uh, challenge homelessness, to um, develop more sustainable practices within you know, housing or whatever they want to, you know, the, their designs are. When they've really seen that it's meaningful to people, and it's not, you know, you know, there's a lot to do with robotics, which is extremely important. But, you know, it's been more than just the make task to make something move from this space to that space. Then girls have been just as equally as boys, um, um, but they seem to have more affinity and more um, uh, enthusiasm uh, to, to take part in those. But at primary, we still see, not don't see those divides. Um, the teacher CPD thing, some of the lovely work that experts do, that if you fix ed, fix education, um, their works are a lot around the social application of engineering and the fixes in the world and that's really supported uh, some of the teacher CPD that we've had as well. <clears throat> One of the uh, challenges I, I, I uh, kind of picked up was um, this whole, the, this notion of engineering habits of mind. It's quite, these are quite esoteric concepts, mm -hmm. uh, systems thinking, uh, adapting and so on. Did, did, the, did, did language play an important role, Julie, in terms of how uh, both teachers and children engage with this, um, you know, it, certainly in the primary school setting? Um, well, I think language is really important and we made um, a, a real effort to actually use the vocabulary all the time in their lessons, in the lessons and talk about um, when we observe something like systems thinking or adapting, we would bring that to the attention of the children. Um, and we might have that as a focus for a lesson as well. So one of the objectives might be um, in this lesson, you are going to learn the skill of improving. Uh, but I think, I think what's really important is that what we try to do is create a culture in our school in which these engineering habits of mind flourish and and in that and um, because of that because we were trying to do that what we did was we embedded engineering into all areas of the curriculum so we didn't just although i talked about engineering days we didn't just do engineering twice a term we we tried to embed engineering into literacy so the books we chose we chose so that we could uh, solve engineering problems uh, we embedded it into science, so at the end of our science topic we might have uh, an engineering make to assess the children's learning. There are plenty of opportunities in the curriculum to embed these engineering habits of mind. Really interesting. Um, Terry XL uh, comments, I was impressed by your plan B for a secondary speaker to take over during the video dropout. It was entirely uh, by chance, uh, uh, Terry, that we had an extra speaker. So <laughs> there's no plan B, it was just luck. Um, the the, fi the final job. question, we're running out of time, I'm afraid, but the, 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 the final question goes to Joe McGeehan. Uh, and this is um, uh, really the, the million dollar question. Uh, is uh, evaluation and impact. So um, uh, maybe Lynn, to, to you first on this. 
Uh, have you seen any measures of impact or success of this approach for children going forwards in their in their school career and whether that's around self-efficacy for engineering or um, you know in, improvements in attainment in the uh, uh, numeracy literacy and so on okay so if you're looking for percentage percentage increases in you know um, standard yeah, give me the numbers come on spike, give me the numbers no, no but if you're looking um, the what will with the progressing um, progressing to be an engineer project now where we'll be able to quite clearly understand and articulate uh, trajectories for children progressions for children we are seeing change happen so you know a child is moving from this, this stage to that stage yes now is that standardized is that understood in the assessment framework no it isn't um, and it's not we've not had a standardized and control group sex set with a, sort of that kind of trial yet to take this forward at scale um, so yeah I'll be honest now we haven't got that indicative data other than teacher self reports which I lay a massive claim to where teachers are saying to us that children are doing better they're more engaged one tangible possibility to end on Reese is the school that you can see profiled in one of the slides here Christ the King they took on this notion um, and this engineering habit of mind approach to their curriculum when they were in requires improvement. Now that takes one brave head to say to their governing body, their curriculum, at that point when all of HMI are on top of them, is going to take a very different style of approach. They went at it whole school um, and all endorsement to Nicola Potts. She is, was well out of requires improvement and into good and she claims that this is what made the difference both for the enthusiasm and creativity that came out of their staff but also that shone out of their children when they had a new way to learn. That's a, what a very powerful endorsement to finish on. Um, can, I, can I just mention my please. logbook? Oh, go on, last word on you Julie. Anyway. Uh, only, only because uh, what we've done at Road Heath is every child has had a logbook so from 2016, everything that I've done in engineering has been um, recorded in this log book. So although, so this represents, uh, I think, a real body of evidence as to where they've started and where they've moved on to in four years, um, which uh, we're actually very proud of at Road Heath. And, yeah. and we've uh, disseminated this out to schools in our local area as well. So, so in a sense, that's evidence, I think. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Michael Faraday, who kind of uh, historically uh, um, uh, uh, you know, created the first long book, would be very impressed, I'm sure. Um, uh, thank you once again to uh, Lynn Bianchi for a great presentation and to you and colleagues Jonathan and uh, Judy Wisco from uh, Rosie's Primary School for uh, a great Q&A session. Uh, that's it from us this week. Next week, we're starting at the slightly earlier time of 9.45 because we are having a panel discussion on the impact of COVID-19 on engineering, education and skills. Uh, your host for that will be our chief executive at the Academy, Dr. Hayatun Silam, and she'll be joined by a number of uh, representatives from schools further and higher education and industry. Uh, so, uh, do join us for the earlier time of 9.45 next week. Until then, goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>